And that's my biggest pet peeve. Whenever like a gravel bike or a touring bike comes out and they, they put on, they slap on like a compact road double. That is like so lazy. That's like, that's the cheapest like stuff we could like order in bulk. We'll just put on whatever bike we have. Welcome back everybody to another episode of Bikes and Bourbon. I'm Russ from Pathless Pedal. I'm Toffer from Pedal Missoula. And today we are gonna nerd out about bikes and drink some bourbon. Yeah. Uh, but let's get to the bourbon first. What are we drinking today? Oh, hold on. There's <laughs> some pregame still. <laughs> there's still some there's still some pregame that okay, are we clear? <laughs> Alright, we're good. Sorry about that, folks. Um so picked up the bottled and bond by Old Forester. Um 1897 bottled and bond. Uh, Old Forester is, I feel like a... As opposed to Young Forester. Yeah, to, to, to Young Forester. Or John Forester. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the <laughs> vehicular cyclist talk. <laughs> Get that out of here. That's for the um, true uh, transportation bike nerds yeah, to, yeah. <laughs> to unpackage. Yeah. <laughs> Google, Google it. So uh, this bottled and bond, this is to me, um, this falls under like a kind of a gimmicky bourbon. Okay. Because Old Forester has been around for a long time. I think they are actually, you know, way back in like the 1890s, they were yeah. the first to bottle in glass okay. bourbon because before yeah. you just send your barrels places. And you just kind of straight straight drink out of the barrel. Yeah, just <laughs> out of the barrel. So um, the Bottled and Bond is a law, is an, an act mm -hmm. from 1897 to keep whiskey whiskey. Um, so people don't like like uh, dilute it with water or, or soak, just like soak it in oak so it color, like the okay. water turns brown right. and then you're like, here, buy this <laughs> bottle of brown liquid, it's whiskey. Right. And then people get home and they're really upset, but then your snake oil cart has disappeared right. or whatever. So, so, so it's kind of like quality control for bourbon. Yeah, and so it's 100 proof, which okay. is kind of like on the higher end for bourbons. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, it's like, so the gimmicky thing to me about it is that they're kind of doing like an, a throwback thing. Okay. So I feel like whenever a distillery tries to do that, I'm always kind of like, right. is it really like, are you making, are you just trying to like- Play on the heritage. Play on the heritage. Okay. Cause yeah, I mean, Old Forester has been around. It's old. Yeah. It is old. <laughs> uh, they've been around for a long time. Not as old as very old Barton though. Right. <laughs> um, so, um, all right, let's. This will be interesting because we were pre-gaming something completely <laughs> different uh, than this. Um, there's not a lot, for me, there's not a lot going on in the notes. Like there's like so, the, the the burn of the alcohol. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, that's like the only thing yeah. I really can get on the nose. Like, I mean, obviously we just opened this bottle, so. All right. Where does this fall like price, price point wise? For us in town, this was thirty dollars. Okay, so affordable. On the yeah, definitely on like I consider affordable to be like a thirty to forty dollar. Yeah. I mean like, I mean that's not affordable. To, mm. <laughs> like you can get cheaper. <laughs> you get, but it's like if it's you're gonna looking, taste like cinnamon or honey or yeah. something. <laughs> yes, thirty dollars is like because I mean, the Jefferson's Ocean was like, like right. a hundred dollar bottle for yeah. us. So yeah. here in Missoula. Yeah. I can't get away from the alcohol, yeah. like on the nose. For me, it's it's pretty bright. Um, you got you know cement. Mm -hmm. um, it's relatively sweet, but I feel like it, it's missing kind of like the deeper, darker kind of character of a, like something more complex. You know. Yeah. Like I would, mm. you know, like if if I was given this, I'd drink it. It would make a great mixer, old fashioned. Oh you yeah. Know? Uh, maybe a, a flask whiskey, mm -hmm. um, but not yeah. something that you know you'd, you'd kind of you ponder need, too you long. Need to, right? <laughs> yeah, because um, they obviously know how to make right. bourbon, and this is like a solid. Yeah, I mean, it's not like bad. It's just right. like when you compare but, but, it to like really good things, it's right. not it's not that deep. <laughs> right. So it's like a, it's one of those things. Yeah, where you're like, well, if you want a solid, like I don't know, solid, but like. A good bottle of bourbon for thirty dollars, like right? It's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's maybe perfectly, try this, but, perfectly uh, acceptable. Today we're going to talk about uh, have we reached peak gravel, especially in terms of technology. Mm -hmm. Lots of I don't know, quote unquote, innovations coming out. Some, yeah, still some that I think are more gimmicky, yep. um, and some that are actually practical. Yeah. Uh, so where do you want to start? Do you want to start with the gimmicky stuff? Yeah, or the practical? it's always we'll go from the 
from the 1897 bottle <laughs> of bourbon. So one of the things that caught uh, our eyes like a couple weeks ago was uh, Pinarello uh, debuted, yeah. launched uh, this road bike that had tunable rear suspension. Mm -hmm. You controlled it with your app. It controlled a elastomer in, in the back that gave you like a whopping 20 millimeters of suspension. And like from, from what I read, uh, the, con the control was like on or off. It wasn't like levels of stiffness, it was just right. like either it's, so you, it's on or off. The app just turns it on or so off. So I don't know if I want that much mm. complexity in the bike for, for that little travel, you know? I feel, yeah, yeah, you and I are about nuance. <laughs> like we, we can appreciate subtle changes in ride quality. I mean, like that's something that we talk about with like different tire yeah. widths and things like that. So, but 20 millimeters of rear, and for, for something that for you need that, like a smartphone that's like $700 and God knows what the <laughs> suspension thing costs for like a very particular bike. Right. That seems like you're you're working awfully hard <laughs> for, tw for that 20, 20. Yeah. That's 20, yeah. So interesting, like once again, kind of interesting <laughs> concept. I don't know if the payoff is completely there for so me. I, I read one like person actually review that wrote it and he, yeah. he liked An it. An actual it, user, not just. He likened it to like, oh, it's like riding some supple tubulars. I'm like, well then why wouldn't you just get some supple tubulars? <laughs> yeah. No, that's a, that's a common, I feel like that's, as some of these things happen, people are like, or you could just ride, you know, 650B by 48 right. and have a similar, you know, fit. and it's like, well, then yeah. get the tires. Right. Like, even the tires are not, they're not that expensive and then you can change them out. Yeah. It's, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, so this is like a topic that, if you guys uh, watched our most recent PLP Talks, we interviewed uh, Guitar Ted. Yeah. Who, uh, you know, started one of the founders of Trans Iowa, which then gave birth to events like Dirty Kanza. And uh, at one point in the interview, I asked him, you know, is are we reaching peak gravel? Has, are there certain things in terms of like technology that's it's like jumping the shark? Yeah. You know, and um, he didn't call out anything specifically if you haven't watched the interview. But, um, you yeah, know, things like suspension, like there, there's diminishing returns, especially yep. for like short travel suspension. Right. You know, where I don't know if it makes sense to have something that complicated for, for 20 mil. Right. And people can, people have given us a hard time and given you a hard time for talking about, you know, like gravel bikes, why do you need some of this stuff? We've been riding gravel. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I guess like we have our preferences for right. like, But yeah, there is something that is a little bit, because you start to get into like, yeah, technology and weight. Right. Issue. Like, I mean, I'm not a big weight weenie, right. not at all really. But yeah. like, when you start to look at those, those things, like, what's the point of adding like this app controlled right. suspension. I mean, yeah. on your bike, like it just doesn't seem, yeah, diminishing returns. Yeah, yeah. One big eye opener, though, I have to say, is uh, you know, testing the uh, Velo Velo Orange polyvalent. Yep. With a quill stem, like uh, it been been ages since I've ridden the bike with quill with a quill stem. Right. And like the first thing I noticed, like I think like anyone would notice this, is just like how much compliant the front There's end is. It's like just pushing it down, it moves. There's, yeah, there's just a little. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, you know, without even trying, it's about like maybe 50% to the same compliance as like something like the Redshift suspension stem. Yeah. Uh, but old technology that, 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 that serves a function, you know? Yeah, and then you start to mix that in with other things, like tires. Yeah. You can start to get some of the feel that you would have. That right. You could use. <laughs> People are wanting to maybe supplement technology for quality versions of, of yeah. Kind of older technology, yeah. I guess. Yeah, like I know the, the Roman Sur frame yep. um, by Crest Bikes, Quill Stem, spec'd up by uh, Ultra Romance. And at first I was like, yeah, that's is that gimmicky. But then like after having ridden that, it's like, oh, but it, there is like, there, there is a noticeable difference. Yeah, there's a reason reason behind what they're doing. So I don't know, maybe- Method to the madness. Maybe, maybe Quill Stems will make a comeback. That'll be the, the, the new, the old new technology. Right. <laughs> and then another company, Bomb Track, mm -hmm. which, is kind of st kind of still emerging in the U.S. market. I yeah, feel like they're, they're they're I think they're kind of established in Europe. Yeah. Not so much. They don't have like strong distribution in, in the U.S. Right, and they came out recently with a adventure. It's an adventure bike. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Using buzzwords now. Um, I think but they, it has. They called it like a hyper hyper gravel. Hyper gravel. Right. So it has a suspension fork like. The kind that you remember from the 90s or 80s. <laughs> um, I mean, like a true, like it looks like a mountain bike fork. Right. But there's 
40 millimeters of travel. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I guess that's twice as much as the, the, the weird Pinarello thing. But it's also like, you know, 90 to 100 millimeters less than, I mean, th that you would like shred on a mountain bike. Right. Right, like so when you see that fork, you think like, you're not gonna get rad. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe you are, but like it's not designed for, for maybe. Semi-rad you'll get. Semi-rad. You'll, you'll get semi-rad. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, I think there's there's a line, and you know, 40 millimeters like toes that line where. Is it worth it? Yeah, a lot of that could be accomplished by things like frame compliance, you know, maybe a suspension stem or, or seat post or or tire, um, because that, that that doesn't seem like enough where you where it should warrant mm -hmm. like a full-on suspension system. Uh, once again, I think we go back to right. <laughs> we go back to like tech and getting things that will like break on your bike or just that you have to like have maintenance on and yeah. like a steel fork you don't have to do anything to. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just gonna be there for you. Yeah, you don't have to service it yeah. or you know dial the it. Stem is yeah. not, I mean or if you're if you're going that route, I mean those are things that it's like you install and they're good. Right. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about taking them to the bike shop and having somebody kind of like do maintenance on it. Yeah. Um, every so often, which is what you start to get into with some of the tech that's, you know, what people want to add back on. And especially since we've already been there, I don't know if <laughs> if it's worth just bringing back for... Right. Those who don't study history are, <laughs> are doomed to repeat it. <laughs> yeah, so it's just like, come on, like... I don't know, mixed feelings. I mean, what, what do you guys mm. think? Are you guys into uh, suspension, full suspension on the, a gravel bike? Uh, clearly, these are preferences. If you like it, we're not saying... You're terrible people. Uh, no, yeah, like I mean, and it's like definitely a ride quality. Once again, like we tend to appreciate some of the changes that have made gravel bikes. Where you know there are people out there that are like, well, you could just ride your road bike right. on your 700 by 28s, and right. you're, you're, you know I did that all the time, and you're like, that's yeah. great, but yeah. like I like a little bit more comfort. And people, once right. again, there's like it's a spectrum of like comfort. And some people went a little bit more um, for a variety of reasons. I mean, there's a lot of like your hands just being like the vibrations of gravel yeah. for a yeah. longer event. It's like it helps to have dampening. And so I could see there being benefits to it. Uh, but for like an, a bike that I would want to ride like all the time, like I just, right. for me, that's not. So it seems like a lot of bike, Yeah, you know, to, to drag around that suspension. Um, yeah, I don't know. And I also think that there's something fun to the whole idea of underbiking, of like having <laughs> the slight, slightly inappropriate bike for the, the, the terrain. Not like yeah. so like grossly inappropriate where it's just dumb. Right. But where maybe you're not comfortable all the time and that kind of adds to the sense of adventure. Yes. And, yeah, I've been, I've been thinking more about the whole underbiking yeah. <laughs> idea. Suspension on things, good. How you get the suspension, Questionable. <laughs> Questionable. Like, For a matter we, of preference. We, we ha yeah, we have our <laughs> concerns and questions about it. I mean, just from a purely like economic standpoint, like, okay, do, would I rather get the suspension out of like a $400, $600 suspension fork or, you know, $160 worth of tire? Right. You know, where I can tune it actively, um, you know, swap it out if I don't like it. Right. Um, with like little consequence, you know? Right. Different tread, different yeah. casings, different, yeah. When, one of the other things that we were gonna talk about was uh, another bike nerdy thing, mm -hmm. but maybe um, there was a, a comment from Ryan Tracy mm -hmm. on our last video that was talking about bike shops. Yeah. And saying that bike shops should have, um, talking about community bike shop events and things like, you know, like what right. makes a good community bike shop. And there was like classes, um, like, how to fix stuff on your bike. Right. Um, <clears throat> there was the like intro to bike touring, camping, mm -hmm. and then there was like events. You know, that was that was Ryan's three kind of things that he. So like the educational component, and then some kind of social things. Yeah. So it sounds like REI. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's it's like I think, uh, you mentioned that REI does do some they, interesting they, things they do. In, some, in this space. Um, I think the the how to thing though we've like bicycle people have focused for so long on 
like kind of some weird how-to stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think tire, obviously fixing like a flat or tire, like that's that's like that's Essential a good that's a good thing. Yeah. But I think there's sometimes that like I've been where you talk about um, like cleaning your chain and like like lubing it and stuff that that, that that can feel make bicycling to new people seem like more All right like. How often do I need to be doing this? Yeah. And I mean, I guess it's like it's good to. I understand it's good to like lube your chain every so often, once a month. I would maybe say. Well, whenever, whenever oh. my chain starts to look orange, then that's. <laughs> you do it. All right. Different. I go once by again, color. Different. <laughs> There's a color chart. I hold up to the chain. It's like, oh, good for another week, or. <laughs> well, like somebody knowing when their chain is done. Right. Like the chains, I think, wear out quicker than people think right uh and so like moving your chain is good and can help prolong its life for a little bit yeah but there's things like like maybe knowing like when your chain just needs to be replaced because mm -hmm. um it's no longer like you, the problem in your shifting is not anything with like the cable the cables or, or yeah. anything it's just that you're so there's that uh so how, some of that how-to stuff, like tubeless setups All right but like on the trail like for people that like ride gravel or mountain bike like Knowing how to install, like, because like when you're at home and you like, you've set your tires up tubeless. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, it was a headache. <laughs> you, you deserve a drink. You deserve a drink. <laughs> and then you go and you you ride and like you get you get like a leak and you have to use like a bacon strip. Oh yeah. But you've never done it before so, because so um, so yeah. So somebody should have a class on like how right. to like. So we should just have like old tires and just like <laughs> stab them. Stab them. <laughs> Because that's what you need is like, that's like, that would be helpful. It's, it's like a real world, experience. real world situation. I think too highly of my own mechanic <laughs> slash YouTube video watching skills, but there's a lot of like beginner stuff that you can learn by like watching a video right. uh, on YouTube and then uh, trying it yourself and you might have some headaches, you might get frustrated, but like you can like work through it without damaging your right. bike. Yeah. But then there's other things like, um, Think bleeding hydraulic brakes. Right. <laughs> that you would maybe appreciate somebody like walking you through it. And you don't always want to go into your, I mean, I don't recommend going into your local bike shop and saying, can I watch you do this thing? Cause like, right. they're busy and yeah. they yeah. don't want to do that. But when they have like a maintenance night where they can like, yes, we will show you what we're doing when we bleed your right. hydraulic brakes. Um, or at least get the, the theory out there so you can kind of like work through it on your on, own right. setup or something, right. you know? Well, some of that stuff, because it's like there's, uh, I don't know a lot about it, but I know you don't want bubbles. <laughs> You have to wear gloves. Um, so no LaCroix. It's like hydrochloric and, acid, right? Or right. <laughs> yeah, so you're screwed. But, um, you know, yes, the basic stuff, but also there, you know, there's some other kind of specific knowledge, like as a, someone that likes bikes, wants to work on their, on their bike, needs, you know, maybe not like a 101, but like a 201 level. Yeah, or sometimes like, that goes to like wheel truing. Yeah. And it's like, I don't know how often I'm gonna like true my, and then it's like, do you have a stand at home? Right. Like who who's can, gonna can, be truing yeah. their own wheel? It's like a cool thing to learn, and it's like the super critical part of your bike. So I understand like wanting to know how it works or being able to like fix it. Right. But how often are you like truing a wheel? Mm -hmm. uh, but you're fixing like a bacon strip flat probably more often, or you're right. something like something like wrong with your derailleur when you're like out there. Like yeah. that's much more likely to happen that like. I feel like those classes could focus more on like real world problem solving right. versus <clears throat> like theoretical bike <laughs> assembly knowledge. That's my take on that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, coming up on PLP Talks, I interviewed uh, Arlie Jenkins, uh, who's opening up uh, her own bike shop in Denver or has opened up her own bike shop in yeah. Denver with a focus on families. And uh, we, we go in a bit about how she uh, plans to build community with like events and stuff. So, so stay tuned for yeah. for that. Not not to be a spoiler, but I was talking with uh, Arlie about was uh, we were talking about like all the certifications that they have for bike shop employees. Yeah, and almost all of it is focused specifically on the technical aspect, and none of it is focused on the customer service part. Yeah, you know. So there's mm. like so what we what we end up having is lots of like capable, uh, awesome people. Uh, great mechanics, but right. not necessarily trained in like how to you know do stuff like events or programming or or how to juggle like the general public while, as they right. do their their day to day jobs. There's a lot of problems with a bike that somebody who's really knowledgeable can solve in like 
15 minutes right. and it takes me an hour <laughs> to two like you yeah. know like it's just it's yeah. like because i'm like i have to watch the youtube video like three times right i have to start it and stop yeah. it while i'm like turning something and you and, might not have the proper tool right i don't yeah. have yeah and so there's just like oh you have all the things right and yeah. you, you can just like and you've done it like 10 times in the last week right so you know yeah how to do this you you're you get practice with it and so right. and so classes community programming education all good things yeah. uh, to happen to uh, community focused bike shop again stay tuned for the the interview with arlie and now we get to go back to Gear. super bike nerdery yeah so i think like you know we we mentioned about we we talked initially about you know technology technology that might be <sighs> kind of i don't know jumping the shark but then there's also technology coming up uh, hopefully, I think the, new, the next trend in gravel stuff is kind of reasonably sized crank sets and chain rings. Yes. Like I'm, I'm, I'm of the opinion of, you know, we have the, the compact road double, which is kind of like a mini version of the road double, which is, you know, I think terribly named because it actually should be called the road racing double. You know, we mm. get so much of the, the, the stuff we get on bikes is trickle down from, from yep. racers. Yep. And it's just not appropriate. Yeah. You know, um, so we're seeing this this newish newish trend of the wide range double or the big yeah. the big chain ring being only a 46 or 44 or 42 right. or even the 40. Our thoughts about the so like a while back, uh, Morgan uh, Taylor from Found in the Mountain Instagram, mm -hmm. he posts stuff on the Rad of us all the time. He wrote a little thing about Easton and we talked about it when he posted it. Yeah. And then there was a thing on um, Adventure Cycling's newsletter that was about uh, one of their staff riders trying out a 46. 4630 or something. Yeah, something like that, you know, and, and talking about the benefits. But then Bicycle Quarterly, <laughs> God bless them, uh, is coming out with some new new crank sizes. And they already had like a 4630 right. that they offered in there, like Renee Hurst. Yeah. Um, but they're going down, I th think it's 44 like and 42. Yeah. Which is getting like, so <laughs> I recently, so then, so that that was all happening. Like there was kind of bicycle quarterly announcing those changes. And I recently went like full the other way. <laughs> and Rivendale has a crank set that they've designed that's like 38, 20 something. Okay. Yeah. Um, that I have on the page straight now. Yeah. So I went from a triple, which had like a 48 maybe on the, you know, as the big ring. Um, but then with that, because it was 48, you had like a bunch of like yeah. other options to like a 38 and 28. Or 24 Thir or something. Yeah. <clears throat> so small, small stuff. Small stuff. Yeah. And it's really nice. <laughs> like, um, yeah, like, a, like the, my, our daily drivers, the Vias, we have them outfitted with like a 40, 28. Yeah. So it's a, it's technically a mountain bike double, but yeah. we've been running it on our commuter right. uh, road touring bike. And I think it's great. I think there's yeah. like an, an initial fear, maybe that like, oh, I can't keep up or I'm not gonna have a high enough gear, but in like practical day-to-day -day use. Like I, I barely spin it out. Right. I mean, like I think for the, for the 11, if you run it through the uh, you know, bike cal calculator, if you spun that out at 90, you'd be going 25 miles per hour. Which you know some people you know may do all the time, but with my fishing gear like boots and waders and yeah. stuff, I'm not gonna hit very often. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the thing is that I feel like that there's kind of like when we've talked about tires in the past and we've yeah. talked about how 700 by 33, 35 used to be this like, <laughs> oh you're going cross wide like you're really that's running huge. Yeah, like you're running a wide tire and then now. It's pretty commonplace for companies to be offering a like 650 40, 40. by 48. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. It's seems no, it's no big deal. <laughs> they're no big deal on a lot of the new new bikes that come out, and so I feel like the 42 40 big chainring is yeah. like that's the equivalent there. Yeah, where <laughs> I think people have thought for a long time like. Oh, I just can't turn over that big chain ring. Like I must be out of shape, right? Or like I must. Like, <laughs> I, so I remember like when I first got in the bikes, I had this. I found this old, beautiful, like, I think it's like a, a, a Tosimo, like an Italian-built road bike. 
and the crank set on it was like if like a 5339 <laughs> and i was like try like like immediately off of the the big chain ring onto the small small chain ring yeah and like man bicycling's hard yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so i think like as as like a person new to cycling um you know maybe not an enthusiast yet definitely not a racer like i think these smaller chain rings you know will get more people right. into bikes but then if you take it off road or mm -hmm. if you have it loaded down with things i yeah. mean all that weight starts to like even just like a small lightweight camping setup yeah for an overnight it's like you're going out like when i think about doing that on, on like a bike that i have this type of gearing on i'm like i want to go out with my friends i'm having fun right I don't need to like race to the campsite. <laughs> I'm not trying to get there like super fast. There's no, there's no like jer special jersey, like first to the campsite. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. I think actually if you're like, you're first to the campsite, that's like. <laughs> you have to, you, you have to start the fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's like responsibility <laughs> with that. So definitely when. Yeah, th you know, and that's my biggest pet peeve. Whenever like a gravel bike or a touring bike comes out and they, they put on, they slap on like a compact road double that is like so lazy. That's like, that's the cheapest like stuff we could like order in bulk. We'll just put it on whatever bike we have. Right. You know, like no, no thought went into that. <laughs> right, because uh, having that lower gearing, I mean, it, it's, it helps you kind of like feel like you're not uh, like suitable for bikes. Like, oh, I'm not strong <laughs> enough. Somebody could say that with those gearings that you have a faster cadence. And, that, and I guess like that can be a preference if you're a spinner or a masher. Right. Totally get the kind of differences in what makes you know, somebody comfortable when they're pedaling. Right. But I I like a little bit of spinning. Like that doesn't, you don't get more points because you like <laughs> couldn't turn it over and you like were just like smashing it down to get there. Like Bicycle Quarterly coming out with that. And, and so, it, so basically what that means is like the rest of the in industry will catch up in like 10 years. <laughs> That's the, I mean, that is the supple, that is the supple trend though. Right. And Compass was a kind of a, um, one of the first, you know, kind of, you know, first companies saying, hey, this whole 27.5 thing isn't just for mountain bikers or it's right. like it's been used before and it's worth looking at again. And if you don't always use your big chain ring and you're right. like, yeah, like then these crank sets are for you yeah. because they kind of eliminate that whole 48 to 50. Yeah situation where you're just turning over some big ring. Yeah, those hypo hypothetical situations where you're like going downhill with a tailwind and like a bear is chasing you and you need... <laughs> you need well, that's the other thing though, is that, I mean, at what point, like, so I've ridden some of the, like, cause I've ridden some of like the situations like that. Yeah. It's kind of terrifying if you're not used to it. So that's the other thing is that the idea that like, people want to be going 50 and pedaling to go right. faster. <laughs> Um, once again, like I'm not trying to catch somebody right. at the end of a stage at the tour. Right. Like I am just. <laughs> you know, it's 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 like having like gearing that you'll use for like maybe one percent of your cycling experience instead right. of having gearing that you'll use for like the other ninety nine percent. Right. Um, yeah, I, I remember like one of our first touring bikes. I had a Trek five twenty. I had a triple. And I was never in the big ring when we were touring, you know, I was in like the middle and the small and it was like a pain in the butt. It's like, why? Why is there this? <laughs> yeah, why yeah. is this thing? Yeah, this fancy chain ring right? or chain guard. <laughs> It'll stab you. <laughs> a stabby chain guard. Uh, so I don't know, what do, you, what do you guys think of this new trend towards the wide range double? Um, I think like maybe in like six years, we'll all be riding essentially Renee Earth. 42, yeah. <laughs> like 42-ish. We'll, we'll all be riding rando bikes. <laughs> All right. Well, I think on that note, we'll wrap it up. Uh, I don't know. Would you, it kind of, it kind of slightly got a little bit more. I got like a, a, a dash of caramel at the end. Definitely like fades to the background every yeah. time you kind of are sipping on it. Um, it's not like it's any standout. Definitely very thin. Yeah. It's a good bourbon. Yeah. Nothing yeah. that I would just be like. Not heavy. You got to go out. Yeah. And I wouldn't say like, like search this out. You probably have it on your shelves, but um, yeah, but if like you, at your if you see your this store. or like Fireball, you know, you should probably go for this. Yeah. <laughs> so next week uh, we might have some special guests. The next couple episodes, uh, Jason from uh, Swift Industries will be in town. Uh, the our our mother, the mountain folks, are gonna be in Missoula in a couple weeks, so we might have them on. So yep. definitely stay tuned. Yep, and also we might. 
be traveling. That's true. Yeah. Road trip. Road trip. <laughs> Road trip edition. <laughs> so we're, we have some things planned for the Bikes by Bourbon. So you'll you'll be, we'll change the green screen to something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely the green screen will be a different locale. Right, right. So uh, until next time. Keep the supple side down.